Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope you all had a good lunch and uh, ready for another session. I uh, set my timer to go off in one hour so that you know how these professors are. They keep talking and talking, and I want to stop. We'll take a 15-minute break like we're supposed to. Um, as Professor Ju said, I, I got my PhD uh, here. Although the campus wasn't this nice, we didn't have rooms like this. Uh, we were out on the Forestall campus, and uh, uh, things were um, a, little, uh, uh, a little more rustic, you might say. But I'm not going to say things were tough in the old days, because uh, things were just different. And um, Princeton continues to give good education to all of its graduates. And, uh, I'm indebted to this institution. The one thing is that we didn't have any bars back then. <laughs> so when we, when we, I think all of you probably have taken a prelim exam or a qualifying exam. Most of you have had a qualifying exam. You all celebrate afterwards. And we had to go to another city, another town to celebrate because no place here. Anyway, um, I was going to ask all of you, um, um, since the subject here is turbulent combustion, um, how many people have taken a course in turbulence? Okay, okay, good, good, a lot of people. And I assume that most people have taken a course related to combustion, is that true? Okay, well, I don't have time during the week to review everything, but um, I, I want to, first of all, uh, convince you that it's an exciting area. There are a number of job opportunities, both in academia and in industry and in government labs in turbulent combustion. Because it's such a difficult subject, um, this, you'll have these same uh, opportunities uh, throughout your career. Uh, we're not going to solve anything, but we can work hard at it. Um, so the way I want to uh, outline the, um, the week is first talk about physical concepts. And I get everybody up to speed on some of the terminology and ideas that we use in turbulent combustion, especially we use in modeling. And then tomorrow, I want to talk about kilohertz laser diagnostics. PLIF is fluorescence to uh, image the flame, and PIV is a velocity imaging of the flow field. And uh, we need these measurements because we have uh, lots of models, maybe too many models. And we want to determine which are the good ones and which are need to be maybe improved. Um, Wednesday, I want to talk about um, uh, the models um, and how measurements can, can help both in the non-premixed and premixed cases. Thursday, we'll talk about partially premixed flames because most examples in real life, and I see some people from Exxon and uh, from companies, uh, they're dealing with real life flames. And most flames are partially premixed, which means they have non-premixed and premixed flames together in the same flame and sometimes in the same place at different times. Finally, we'll talk about future challenges on Friday. Now, um, if you talk to the people at General Electric, and they've been funding uh, some of the work done by my students, they tell you premixed is the way of the future. Um, a lot of uh, uh, jet engines, for example, if you, if you look at movies of the Concorde, back from the old days when the Concorde was flying, you saw this big trail of soot coming out of the back of the engine when it took off. Um, and premixed um, is, um, uh, lean premixed, pre-vaporized is a technology that General Electric uses in their existing engines. Um, of course, the, the uh, automobile industry, which is around where I live in Detroit, uh, they've recognized this a long time ago. And, and, uh, but there are problems with premix, because if, if you've ever uh, used a Bunsen burner, you know in a chemistry lab that if you don't set it just right, the flame blows out or flashes back down the tube. So premix flames are much less stable, but they are mu much cleaner. Um, so we need to learn what does turbulence do, why do we need to model it, and why are the existing models not adequate? I mean, you can run fluent. Some of you have access to uh, fluent, I assume, right? And, or some of these commercial codes. You can run premixed turbulent flames or non-premixed turbulent flames, but they're not considered to be um, acceptable for scientific 
uh, application, um, there are more modern methods that people are using for good science. The turbulent reaction rate is the critical issue in this whole talk, in, this, in the whole week actually. How fast do um, turbulent flames turn reactants into products? And uh, if you can imagine a flame is something that's thin and flopping around, um, if you were at a single point in that flame, sometimes the flame would be passing over you and sometimes it wouldn't be anywhere near you. So there's a probability that reactions are occurring at a given point and we need to define the probability density function. And this gets to the other last two topics which I'll talk about either the end of today or, or next or tomorrow. So um, if you have a handout uh, of, the, um, uh, of, the, uh, of the slides, you'll see that uh, the first one is, the first reference is one by uh, Professor Quo. It's a really good uh, book on fundamentals of turbulence, turbulent combustion. So if you're interested in this subject, I recommend you get it. Uh, you can get a, a PDF version or you can, get, you can buy the hardcover version. If, but if, if you're really interested, that's a good book. Um, uh, uh, Professor Peters has a, sh a short, small book, and as well as um, uh, Professor Foreman Williams. It's a small book, it's kind of old. Um, Steve Turns, a professor at Penn State, has a very good uh, undergraduate level course that he uses this uh, intro to combustion. And then there's some older books that are also good you may want to get. Of course, Professor Law has written some of the seminal papers that uh, have given us uh, the insight of what is going on. And um, his paper with, with uh, Jackie Sung is a classic, and it shows how um, aerodynamics and fluid dynamics stretch and strain and extinguish premix flames. And then I wrote a review some years ago of just sort of like the state of the art in turbulent combustion, uh, if you're interested in these review papers. Um, Rob Barlow at Sandia has a very nice workshop on turbulent non-premix flames, and he has all the best data in the world, uh, I would say, collected in, um, in this uh, website, and it's, he makes it available. And uh, you can see other uh, papers that are, some of these are a little bit older. The German uh, paper by Heinz Pitch, um, French group, Poinceau, um, uh, um, and others that, that are really uh, classic papers that if you want to start in this subject, they're pretty simple to read compared to some of the other stuff. Anyway, to motivate my talks this week, I'll give you some pictures of, of a combustor that Jacob Temme uh, ran. Uh, I gave him like the world's worst uh, PhD thesis topic because it was really hard to run this combustor. It was a, a, it was a, a fuel injector um, from General Electric and they gave us a lot of money, but they wanted us to run this flame at high pressures with a Jet A a liquid spray fuel and uh, then do laser diagnostics in it. And uh, this is a, a fuel injector that's used um, on the GENX engine on the Boeing 787, which is a brand new technology of lean premixed pre-vaporized combustion. And you can see that it looks pretty yellow in the middle and kind of blue on the outside, and that's when it's running right. Uh, it's got a pilot flame in the middle. So uh, th this, is, this is the center line here, and so you inject some uh, liquid jet A fuel and you form a spray, and you have air coming out, and the, the velocities are pretty low here, so you get an attached flame that just sits here. It's, it's what we call a diffusion flame in the sense that uh, there's mostly all fuel in the middle here and then air coming in from the side, so it only burns along this edge here. But it's very, very stable. It's like the pilot flame in your furnace. If you ever look inside your furnace, you have a, a flame, or you may have a pilot flame in a, some other household device. It's, 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 it's usually either premixed rich or, or non-premixed, but it's, it's not lean uh, because that, that's not stable. But this pilot flame produces a lot of soot and CO, and it's not a really good flame. So only 5% uh, of the, the total fuel in the jet engine would be burned here. 
like 95% would be burned by taking main air, you take the, f the liquid fuel, and it's a jet in a cross flow, and there are about 32 of these little holes all around the circumference. And um, the velocities here are kept very high so that the flame cannot flash back to this spot here. And so it's a lifted flame. And there's a lot of mixing going on in here, so they call it a premixed flame. But it's very stratified. It's not uniform. So there's a lot of fuel-air variations in here. But this burns very clean, and that's what this blue region is here is. And you can get very low emissions, and yet you know, the flame is stable. Even if this flame blows out, this pilot flame always is there. So there's a safety issue uh, that, of course, jet engine people worry about. And one of the problems is, of course, that, uh, like I said, if it's, if it's premixed, sometimes it doesn't stay where you want it to. So uh, Jacob, during his thesis, he uh, took movies of this flame. And you can see that sometimes it's attached, and then other times it just totally lifts off and blows down. down. So it's sort of oscillating in space. And this cause, causes engine growl. You can hear a loud noise, and Professor Kendall will tell you all about the theory of <coughs> acoustics. Uh, but this is a serious problem, and you can't run the engine at this particular condition. So they have an operating envelope, and they like to operate over a wider range. Um, so that's, a, that's an issue. How, how do you model that? It, it's partially premixed because um, you can see that a, a one of the flames, the, the pilot flame, is non-premixed, and the main flame is premixed, and so they're all just sort of um, um, superimposed on top of each other. And so we're going to define partially premixed is that the equivalence ratio varies in space from pure air to pure fuel. So sometimes at a point you see premixed combustion, sometimes non-premixed, and you need to know the probability of each. Because if you're modeling them, OK, you put a premixed model half the time and a non-premixed model half the time, and maybe you get the right answer. Uh, now, stratified premix is something that uh, Professor Masri talked about at the last symposium. And uh, we've also written papers on it. But it, it means that the equivalence ratio varies in space, but you're always within the flammability limits, which would be equivalence ratio of 0.5 to 2. So, so it's always premixed. Um, but sometimes it's rich and sometimes it's lean. And uh, this is a serious problem because if you're a jet engine developer or an automobile engine developer, you need to model these types of problems. And uh, now, um, different parts of the world have different models. Uh, Ken Bray is a retired professor at Cambridge, and the British have this flamelet model, which they define a flame surface density, which I'll describe. Um, now, the Stanford group, these three people, uh, talk about a different model, a progress variable model. Uh, Ponceau is from France. He's a colleague of Professor Kandel. I mean, they, they know each other. And uh, he has a model, a thick and flamelet model. And then there are uh, other models by Professor Menon at Georgia Tech and Pope at, at Cornell. And. Um, uh, the jury is still out as far as which of these models will be the best. In fact, we don't even know. If you have a flamelet model, you're assuming that a turbulent flame is, is like a thin flame that is wrinkled and moving all around. But the question is, uh, when is a, uh, a turbulent flame filled with flamelets, and when is it more distributed or broadened? Um, and. Um, the other issue, of course, is if it's a premixed combustion, um, if you've taken a combustion course and you've covered premixed flames, you know that it's a wave. It, uh, you can have an infinite, uh, a room this big full of premixed um, reactants, and the combustion wave will go wherever it wants to go at whatever speed it wants to go at, and it's a wave. A non-premixed flame is not a wave. It, uh, is restricted to be only where the fuel and the air come in contact from different directions. And so for that reason, it's hard to control where a premix flame stabilizes or goes. And also, it's harder to model it because it's a wave. OK, um, 
I listed some of the problems that are motivating uh, this type of work. Um, HCCI is homogeneous charge compression ignition engine, where you, uh, you basically take a premixed uh, mixture and you compress it as if it was in a diesel, and then you, if you compress it to the auto ignition temperature, it ignites. Um, it's a little different than a, uh, a diesel engine, but it's, uh, it's, everything is, is premixed and then compressed. Um, this is premixed gas turbine. Well, we don't use those on uh, airplanes. We would use a, a, you know, these partially premixed on an airplane that I showed you. But a fully premixed gas turbine would be used on the ground to generate electricity. Uh, GE in uh, South Carolina is doing a lot of work on a premixed gas turbine for electrical power generation. Um, the classic problems that people talk about are in non-premixed, the jet flame uh, is studied at Sandia and other places, a jet in a cross flow, a jet in a co-flow, which may be a hot co-flow or a cold co-flow, and a jet in a swirl flow. These are the, sort of the, the basic building blocks of turbulent combustion. And then uh, if it's partially premixed in a gas turbine, well, like I just showed you in the previous slide, um, you're putting air and fuel in different places and then it's burning downstream and so you can have uh, both premixed and non-premixed. Uh, the Air Force is very interested in afterburners and uh, military type devices. The base of a lifted jet flame, if you have a, a, a jet of fuel and then you light it off, it'll be lifted. And right at the base of that flame, um, things will have mixed a little bit between the, the fuel tube and the flame. And so we'll have both a premixed and non premixed. And uh, the other item is that, you know, if you do research in this area, we're sort of realizing that um, we don't want everybody to build their own experiment. You know, you can say the Princeton experiment or the Maryland experiment, and it, it gets a little bit tedious because everybody's doing sort of the same thing or a variation. Why don't we just set up canonical experiments? Just get one good experiment of, one, of each of these. These are fundamental ex, uh, studies. And then everybody use the same geometry and, and use different diagnostics or different models and apply it. And the, the, the field is sort of going to this. Uh, um, uh, Sandia started this uh, with jet flames and uh, uh, jet and cross flow and uh, uh, Australians are doing the jet and the, the uh, co-flow, and uh, the Germans are doing this jet and the swirl flow. So that's sort of where we're going. Um, that way you can compare um, results. Now, um, even though we have a lot of um, research problems that we haven't solved, we have a lot of new tools, so it's a really exciting area to be in. Uh, this is a, an experimental uh, um, result of uh, Cam Carter and Tong Hun Lee, uh, who took uh, uh, movies of, of a turbulent flame. It's not very turbulent, and you see that it's kind of chopped up. In, it's actually four images stacked on top of each other, but um, with these kilohertz lasers, you can get very nice movies, and this is the reaction zone. And the way they do that is they image CH, which is a radical. It's only existing in the reaction zone. And it's a, you, you shine an ultraviolet laser through the flame, and then you image it, the radiation, the, the fluorescence that comes out from CH. So we're learning a lot of what's happening inside those turbulent flames. And then uh, this is a, a movie of a student, Adam Steinberg. Whoops. Get my cursor here. Um, he did this work at Michigan uh, with me, and um, he's now a professor at University of Toronto. He's doing much more uh, difficult and, and better work now. But this is the first time when we uh, we first time anybody tried to image of vortices going through flames. So he took a PIB, which is a uh, 
uh, velocity field imaging method. He determined what the flame boundary was because um, the particle density changes very abruptly right at the flame. So in this case, he, uh, he used the, uh, the, the change in the particle density to map out where the flame is. And then he used the velocity, the kilohertz of, of velocity field imaging to map out the vorticity field. And so the goal was, the goal was to uh, see turbulent eddies going through the flame. And so uh, this was done, uh, done like six or seven years ago. Because Adam's already got tenure. No, it's actually more like seven or eight years ago, because Adam's already got tenure at Toronto. And uh, um, uh, I just want to point out that um, uh, here's an eddy going through the flame, uh, and here's another eddy ready to come by, it, it, uh, rotating it a different direction. And it, it wrinkles the flame. And, um, And then here's another pair of, of eddies that are coming by, and uh, they'll wrinkle the flame later. And uh, one of the things that Adam wanted to de determine was, uh, are the eddies doing the wrinkling, or are they only doing part of the wrinkling? Because the models say that the eddies go through and wrinkle the flame. Well, what he found was the eddies start the wrinkling process, but then after they go away, the vortices are gone, the flame continues to wrinkle, by something called the Landau instability, because flames are inherently unstable. So you have to model both the turbulent wrinkling of the flame and the Landau instability to get this right. Um, uh, I listed uh, good models. And if you're doing modeling work, uh, is anybody here doing turbulent combustion modeling? OK. OK, well, I hope I'm not going to uh, upset anybody. I put these in the order of what I could understand, and um, some of them are good, but I put them at the bottom because I don't um, fully understand every detail of what they're doing. But these are very easy to understand. Uh, you, it's a flame surface density model with tabulated chemistry. I'll, I'll say uh, Wednesday I talk about the, the, uh, the um, Stanford group in their flame at progress variable. That's quite easy to understand. Now, Poinceau in uh, Toulouse, um, he works with Airbus and at the University of Toulouse. And he has this new model called Thick and Flamelet model. And so his idea was, I, I wrote this down here on this, uh, on this board here, that um, we know that the turbulent burning velocity is related to the, the diffusivity, how fast heat can diffuse upstream times the reaction rate, divided, it's all under the square root. So if he can. This is for a premix flame. The, the, the turbulent burning velocity um, depends on the diffusion of heat upstream and the reaction rate. But now he says that uh, he also noticed that the thickness of a flame, and you can show this from theory, is equal to the square root of the, the diffusivity divided by the reaction rate. So if you have a very high diffusivity, heat is diffusing fast, you get a thick flame. But if you have a large reaction rate, you'll get a thin flame. OK, so this is something I hope you have seen in your combustion class. But he said, well, I'm going to develop a new model. I'm going to put in a fake reaction rate. I'm just going to go to the Arrhenius constants and put in some fake numbers. And I'll make this reaction really slow. But then to compensate, I'm going to put in a, uh, uh, let's say, an unrealistic diffusion rate so that it diffuses really fast. And so what he ends up with, uh, by putting in, uh, I guess he's saying he's making two assumptions that he hope, hopes will uh, counteract each other. So by making this bigger and this smaller, the, the turbulent burning velocity isn't changed, but the thickness of the flame is way, way larger. And the big problem in modeling a, a flame is that if you have these tiny little flames that are um, moving around, uh, you don't have a grid resolution that's called DNS, or direct numerical simulation. If you don't have a, a really, really big computer, you want to uh, have a thick flame. So he, it's sort of an idea that may or may not be right, but he, 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 he thickens the flame artificially, and he does it in such a way that the 
burning velocity doesn't change. And you can resolve things better. And it, it's, it's, a, it's another approach. But as you can see, it's not as realistic as some others. Um, uh, I'll say some more about these other models later. Um, uh, for non-premixed flames, um, steady strain laminar filament model is kind of like the, uh, the basic model. You assume that a non-premixed flame, uh, a jet flame, is a collection of, of very thin laminar non-premixed flames, laminar flames, which uh, can be strained and made thinner or thicker by the velocity field. And um, uh, we use the scalar dissipation rate to um, as, a, as a second variable. And so you have to solve for the, um, the, the flamelet properties as well as the scalar dissipation rate, which is a, a strain parameter. And if you can solve those two equations, you can get a nice uh, result. Um, the problem is that with this model is it works really well, except it doesn't give the, uh, the minor species like carbon, di uh, carbon monoxide, CO, uh, it doesn't do that uh, uh, well enough. And so the, the, these other models are developed to, to do the chemistry a little more accurately. But they also have limitations because they don't do the fluid mechanics as accurately. So the, 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 uh, the, these are all the models that are uh, available. And um, if you're interested in any of these, just look in your uh, handout sheets. and. I've listed some re what I think are really good papers, uh, at least to get started on this. Now, um, I'm a little bit biased because I've worked with some of these people. But if you really want to get everything right, you have to go to a direct numerical simulation and no model at all. Um, Professor Law has worked with the Sandia people, and they get a Bunsen flame that looks like this. and. Uh, my students and I have worked with uh, the Berkeley people, and they computed a turbulent flame that looks like this. And uh, neither of these are very wrinkled. They're kind of low Reynolds number. Um, uh, it's a small domain. It's not really big here. We're talking about like one, uh, uh, two centimeters here, and maybe four or five centimeters here. So it isn't quite the size of an engine. But that's the best we can do, even with the biggest computers. Um, people are using sim simple geometries like a flame and a rectangular duct, and I'll talk about those. Um, but uh, others are working with real geometries, which have real boundary conditions. Okay. Uh, I listed here, uh, they have a forcing term. Um, to keep the turbulence coming into this problem, uh, we don't have a turbulence generator, uh, which would be like a grid or something, because that would be too expensive to compute. And so they artificially create turbulence up here and force it in. So they actually add a term to the momentum equation. So even though we call this direct numerical simulation, like it, it's like the, the truth, it still is not perfect because it, you have uh, some computational uh, uncertainty in how, how, how you're actually producing the turbulence with this artificial forcing term. Uh, now, if you do a flame in a duct, you have periodic boundary conditions, which means on each side of the duct, whatever happens here happens here. And that is not realistic. Here in these two ge geometries, they don't have periodic boundary conditions, so um, it's more realistic. And um, we don't know if, if these uh, slightly wrinkled flames really represent um, real engines in high Reynolds number cases. Um, here's some more. Uh, um, Andy Aspden um, in England published some beautiful pictures of, of turbulent flames that are simulated on the computer uh, with complex chemistry. So uh, as we start to talk about the, um, oh, you know, the, the, the things we want to learn about, uh, we want to uh, talk about um, um, uh, a little later um, how does the turbulent diffusivity increase because of turbulence? Things diffuse faster. This makes the flame shorter, and we can make smaller combustions, combustors. Um, 
General Electric is very interested in reducing the weight of, of everything, but they say the combustor is the hardest thing to improve the design. Uh, they have a whole combustion technology group. Um, um, you can make the, in a jet engine, you can make the compressor shorter by designing the, the blades better. Uh, you can, um, um, you can um, make the turbine smaller, but the combustor you can't make too small. Uh, you know, you, if you wanted to make the jet engine this big, um, you'd have trouble burning the fuel in the, uh, in the, if it was liquid fuel, atomizing and burning in a very short distance. Um, uh, um, turbulence gives you a faster flame propagation, but this can be good and bad. Um, it avoids blowout, but it might cause flashback. And it might cause the flame to be too close to the walls. You know, when GE designs a combustor, they put a lot of holes in it and they get cooling air that keeps the hot flame away from the walls. Well, if you put some hydrogen in that flame, it would, it would attach to the injector and it would cause a heat transfer problem. So you have to have just the right propagation speed for the flow velocity. And that's what I said here. Uh, um, if the velocities are large, you have a short residence time, and so this air is going through your combustor in a short time, and you um, will get less NOx. However, you may not burn up all the CO, and you may not burn up all the soot. And so um, short residence time can be a problem if you have to minimize CO and soot. And um, growl is just a, a, a continuing problem in rockets, in jet engines, and um, Professor Kandel will talk about that. So um, we're not there in terms of modeling any of this, but we are uh, making progress. So uh, as a background for some people who maybe um, haven't done much in turbulence. I, I just want to define some parameters here. The turbulent kinetic energy, this is the velocity fluctuation in the flow direction, and, and these are the velocity fluctuations in the transverse directions. And if it's isotropic turbulence, this is, uh, K is pretty much uh, U prime squared bar, the mean of the velocity fluctuations, which is in meters squared per second squared. Um, in these equations, we often put a little tilde on the top of variables, and this is the Favre average, which means you take whatever you're interested in and you multiply it by the density of the gas at that point, divide by the mean density at that point, and you, then you take the time average. And um, you can see that if you took rho and related, called it rho plus rho prime, and you take u and set it u bar plus u prime, now, then you take the time average. Now, you multiply these all out, and you're going to get four terms. One is going to be um, rho bar times u bar, and divide by rho bar, there's that. One's going to be uh, rho prime times u prime, divided by rho bar. And then there are going to be two other terms, which are zero. And the first one is going to be rho bar times u prime. But you take the average of that, and it's the average of u prime. And U prime is a fluctuation around a mean, so it's like a, it's a sine wave, and you take the average of a sine wave, it's zero. And so um, what, when you take this Favre average, then you are uh, saying that it's equal to the, the true mean velocity plus this other term, which is a, a mass flux. So why would you want to do this? Well, if you, if you um, throw this into the Navier-Stokes equations, the density fluctuations totally disappear. So rho prime is no longer a variable. So we remove rho prime from all the equations. But we add a new unknown, which is this flux, rho prime mu prime. But uh, what we do is we solve the equations uh, in terms of tildes, the, the, the Faber average quantities, and then at the very end, we use this equation where we would solve for it. Now we'd solve for u bar is equal to u tilde minus this flux term. And so if we want to find out what u bar is, uh, we'd have to know this flux term. And we would use this um, gradient diffusion assumption, which says that the, the flux of something is related to the 
diffusivity times a, a gradient. And let me uh, expound upon that in the next um, slide. This is common turbulent flow analysis. It's uh, developed by Prandtl, who was a pr pretty smart person, and so it's, it's uh, valid. Um, so if you, if you have uh, something that's correlated, a density and a velocity fluctuation, you want to see how are they related. So we're going to take this case of, let's say the, the density uh, in, a, in a fluid is something like this. So imagine this to be a boundary layer. Here's the wall down here. It's a, uh, a uh, heated wall. So there's low density here of the gas. And this is cold gas up here, and it's higher density. So there's a density gradient from low to high. And um, there's turbulence. And so a fluid element, it's at A, which has a low density on average, will uh, sometimes jump up to B. And if it does that, it has to have a positive velocity fluctuation. So V prime is positive. So just, just say that's what happens randomly. And then we're going to argue that it takes this low density with it as it goes up. So if you're sitting up here, um, you see this picture I drew on the board here. The density at B is some number. It's a high density up here. And then all of a sudden, this red particle jumps up here, and you get low density for a short time, and then it jumps back up. So this, this is a density fluctuation, which is negative, because it's, the, the density is low for that short time. So at B, at point B, we're going to have a positive V prime and a negative rho prime. So that means, in this example, um, um, in this case, uh, rho prime, V prime, on average, is going to be negative. And it's going to be proportional to d rho dy, because the, the density change, which causes the density fluctuation, uh, depends on the, the distance that it moves and the density gradient. Okay, And so when you, uh, when you put that together, you, you simply say that the, the, the the average, on average, the product of these two numbers is going to be um, V prime times L times the density um, gradient. And then uh, if you write this equation here, that what this means is that this quantity here, whatever it is, it's called the turbulent diffusivity, is just V prime L. And so it is a, a measure of how fast things diffuse um, as they mix up and down. And the same argument holds if a fluid element goes from B down to A. So this is Prandtl's um, thought. And so therefore, this is a very useful equation. Um, if you know what this dt is, and you know the d rho bar dy, you know what this flux is, and you can um, solve your um, conservation equations. Now, I think in my handout, some of these symbols didn't turn out right. But these are Greek symbols. And so what Prandtl is suggesting is that the um, turbulent uh, molecular diffusivity, this is, this is a kinematic viscosity, mu over rho, is u prime L. And, and that's equal to the uh, diffusivity, thermal diffusivity, as well as the mass diffusivity. And so uh, this is in meters per second times um, uh, length. So it's meters squared per second. This is a foundation of turbulent theory, that turbulence basically makes the viscosity a 1,000 times larger than in a laminar flow. So that's, the, that's one of the fundamental ideas of turbulence, turbulent uh, fluid mechanics, is that the viscosity of the fluid goes way up. And the thermal diffusivity, which is the, the way heat is transferred, goes way up. And mass diffusivity goes way up. And they all go up um, equally. Um, but now all of this turbulence has to dissipate. It has to go away because we have a steady problem. And if you're always creating more turbulence, uh, you have to get rid of it. So the dissipation rate is this. 
and it's um, given by the velocity fluctuation cubed over L. So um, this analysis comes from the, simply the fact that the, uh, the, the rate at which you produce turbulence depends on U prime cubed over L. L is the integral scale. And so the rate that it's created has to be equal to the rate that it's dissipated. So um, if you put these ideas together, uh, now U prime is like K, which is, we said, the kinetic energy to the 1 half. And if we say that uh, U prime is K, we can get rid of the U prime and replace it with a K. And so we get uh, K to the 3 halves divided by L. And we can solve L, the integral scale, so um, we said that the, in this new viscosity that's like a thousand times greater than laminar viscosity is, is um, the density of the fluid times the U prime times L. And so you put, you put these in here and you get K squared over epsilon. So the first, um, uh, the first people who did turbulent flow theory said, Let's get rid of this turbulent viscosity and put it in terms of k and epsilon. But now we have to solve for k and epsilon. And so um, Prandtl, which was around, he was around at that time, and he said, well, uh, let's derive a k equation. Now, uh, what he recognized is that turbulence, you know, velocity fluctuation squared here, uh, can be convected from one place to another, and that's this term these two terms. Turbulence can diffuse, and turbulence can be created, and it can be destroyed. So this is an um, equation that tells you how large the velocity fluctuations will be at any one point. It's in the uh, equations uh, in fluent, uh, commercial code, and other simple models. Now, the, uh, another equation, this can be derived directly from the Navier-Stokes equations. So it's, uh, it's exact, but uh, a lot of terms have been dropped, or um, uh, these two terms have been modeled. So it's not quite exact, but it's, it's fundamentally from the Navier-Stokes equation, so it's very believable. Uh, this is another equation, the epsilon equation, which you may have seen in your courses, but it's also developed from the, uh, it's derived from the Navier-Stokes equations, but um, again, there are a bunch of assumptions in how you get the source and sink terms. But you can see it's a convection, diffusion, source, and sink. If you can put the right source and sink in, you, you, you can solve the problem. Um, this example is one I always teach in my classes. Um, suppose you have a grid in a wind tunnel, and right behind each one of these little bars, there's a uh, separated flow in a very small recirculation zone. So there's a whole lot of turbulence being created right at x equals 0 plus. But the, all the turbulence creation is right in here. From then on, the, the turbulence flows downstream, and uh, there's no more creation because there's no more little bars there. So. Uh, if this is a constant density flow, rho bar is constant. Uh, the velocity, the mean velocity, is a constant, uh, just a, a flow in a wind tunnel. Now, d by dy is 0, so there's no diffusion. There's no reason for turbulence to diffuse from here up to here or from here down to here because it's, it's uniform in the y direction. So these derivatives are 0, and these, these terms are 0. This, now, uh, turbulence is produced by velocity gradients, but there are no velocity gradients downstream of the grid, and so there's no more production. This term, d by dy, is 0. OK. And um, so the only, the only equa two equations you have left are the, uh, 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 this one. Um, and I divided rho out. And so you get that the turbulence will decay in the x direction at a rate of, uh, given by epsilon. And uh, epsilon will decay in the x direction at a rate given by this. OK, so you need boundary conditions. You say that you start with a certain turbulence right behind the grid. And you have to be given the boundary condition that 
the dissipation rate here is some number. But if you were given those two boundary conditions, you put this on MATLAB and you get these two curves, you know, you've solved your first turbulent flow uh, problem. But it also points out that um, you need to know the boundary conditions on the dissipation rate, which uh, Fluent tells you sort of how to do that with like a little formula. And, uh, you know, it's not, you may not totally believe it or you may not like it, but that's what they, they tell you to do. So you need a boundary condition for, the, for each of the variables. Now, um, th this, this work was done many years ago, and the nice thing about this model is that you can measure just about everything in, this, in these two equations. You can, model, you can measure K with a uh, laser velocimeter or PIV. Uh, uh, the, uh, the dissipation rate is the, uh, it would be the velocity gradients at a very small scale. And it's hard to measure, but people are starting to do that, measuring very small velocity gradients. Um, and so, you know, if you're, a, if, you're, if you're assessing a model, you sort of want to measure each of these terms and just see if everything adds up. And that's a beauty of, a, of this type of model. As we'll see on um, Wednesday, um, a lot of turbulence models, turbulent combustion models, uh, you can't measure the terms. There are quantities in there, they're just not measurable. And so you sort of have to believe it on faith. So I, I'm hoping that the community will continue to uh, develop models that um, have terms in them that we can measure, so we can assess them. Okay, if you've taken a, a, a combustion course, this is kind of review. Um, if you haven't, it will need this uh, for the next lecture. Um, if you have a non-premixed turbulent flame, you say, well, that's pretty complicated, but um, Zeldovich was one of the first mathematicians to um, work on this problem, and he, he realized you can simplify the problem tremendously if you talk about the mass fraction of H atoms. Now, um, we're going to define Y sub H as the mass fraction of H atoms that are contained in all molecules at one point. And we're going to talk about Y sub H sub 1 is the mass fraction of H atoms in stream 1, which if you have a jet, is usually the, the center jet is fuel, and so it has H atoms in it generally. So let's call this center jet stream 1. And then around that jet is, a, is an outer stream, which may be very large, and that's maybe air. And the mass fraction of H atoms in the outer air stream is zero. So for, for simplicity, let's say that you have methane, CH4, and we're surrounding it with O2. Stream one, we have uh, methane. So in this methane molecule, we have uh, 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 16 grams in this mole of methane. Uh, 12 of those grams are carbon and 4 of those grams are hydrogen. And so of the total 16 grams, uh, 4 of the gr grams are hydrogen. So the mass fraction of hydrogen in that molecule is 0.25. So so plugging that into this equation, which is a non-dimensional uh, measure of the mass fraction of H atoms, we, we, uh, we, we, we um, oh, okay, uh, it would be uh, uh, ZH1 is 0.25. Um, that would be this one and this one. Oh, no, this one right here. Okay, and ZH2 is zero. But now I said, some point downstream, we have two moles of water and one mole of CO2. So the mass fraction of H atoms of, of this three moles of mixture, well, we have um, a total of four grams from the hydrogen, but we have uh, 44 grams for the CO2, and we have two times 18. We have two moles times 18, and so we have a total of um, mass given by this denominator, and so the mass fraction of H atoms in this mixture is 
And so we take Z, the mixture fraction at that point, and it's, it's going to be uh, uh, 0.05 divided by 0.25, which is 0.2. Okay, so why do we do all this? Um, uh, Zeldovich, this famous mathematician, argued that if you take the uh, conservation equations, and now here I'm, I'm, I'm um, um, plotting for a jet, a uh, non-premix jet flame in, with turbulent flow. And so I've, I've, I've put the turbulent diffusivity here, and this is the mass fraction of H2, and convection, diffusion, convection, diffusion. We have three conservation equations, but the hard part is that we have these three reaction rates. Um, um, and, you know, they have like exponential terms, uh, Arrhenius factors, really difficult to handle. But one thing we do know that whatever this uh, Arrhenius exponential function is, um, that uh, the, the mass per second per unit volume of H2O created is related to the mass per second per unit volume of H2, um, in this case, created, which is negative. And so um, if we define reaction rate to be positive if it's created, uh, then uh, this is negative. And so um, um, for every uh, two grams of of uh, hydrogen that we destroy, we create 18 grams of water. And um, for every uh, uh, two grams of hydrogen we destroy, we create 16 grams of O2. So these quantities are related. And so now if you plug these into, these, into this set of equations, um, and then you in replace uh, y, H2 with Z, which we call the mixture fraction, we end up with a conservation equation that has no source term. There's no reaction rate. So that it's a, it's a wonderfully simple equation. And you can solve this, you know, uh, MATLAB um, for many, many geometries. Um, I didn't, this should be a partial, uh, this should be a partial derivative. I, I, uh, I just realized that, uh, it's, it's a, it's a partial, differential equation. So this, this is getting, uh, this is now related to the, the turbulence. We're, get, we're getting, um, uh, uh, getting now into what, how this can be used in turbulent, turbulence. So if we have turbulence filled with strained flamelets, we need to solve the equation, and we solve the equation for z, and that's the only equation we have to solve we don't have to solve the equations for the mass fractions of the other species, which is what I, in other words, uh, um, um, if I solve this equation, I can then determine uh, the terms, I can determine the mass fractions here. So um, to, to, to move on to this, um, Suppose we had uh, methane and O2 still, and we have lean combustion. So I'm going to write CH4 plus 2 over phi O2, where phi is the uh, equivalence ratio. So if phi is 1, um, we have 2 moles of oxygen and 1 mole of methane. And uh, we don't get any oxygen over here if, if phi is 1. But if phi is uh, uh, less than one, then we have more than two moles here, and we're going to end up with some oxygen on the right. So uh, if we apply the fast chemistry idea, what we're saying is that when you burn this, you're going to end up with this mixture. Now, in real life, you end up with CO and radicals and nitric oxide and everything. But if you say fast chemistry, Everything burns really quickly, and you get this. Now, the fast chemistry idea also means that you can never have um, fuel and oxygen together at the same point. So anywhere in the turbulent flow field, you could have a mixture like this, which is basically 
oxygen and products. And in some other place in the flow field, you could have fuel and products, but you can't have fuel and oxygen together except along a, an infinitely thin line, and we call that the flamelet. But now we ask, um, what is Z for this mixture? How, and then uh, if, we, if we solve, uh, if, we, if we determine Z, those, the way I did it just a few minutes ago, we say that for this mixture, which is at some point in the, in the, in the flame, now uh, let me jump ahead and um, I guess I don't have a picture of a jet flame with me. Okay. I don't have a picture here. Uh, this mixture would be, uh, if you think of a jet flame as a, as a uh, coming out of a tube as a, as, a, as a flame with a boundary, this would be on the lean side of the flame, whereas the inside of the jet flame would have f fuel in products. So we're only talking about the outside of the flame here, the air side of the flame. Now, um, we compute Z for this mixture, and again, there's a, uh, four grams of hydrogen, and, and uh, we do this, and we get um, uh, Z to be a function of phi now. And we then solve for phi. And then we, um, we could also say, you know, what is the um, mass fraction of oxygen in, the, um, in this mixture? Now it's a little different. We would say that the, uh, the mass of the... Uh, Oxygen is 32, so we have the number of moles of oxygen times 32 grams per mole for oxygen divided by this same um, uh, weight of the, of, the, of the entire mixture, and we get a, another function of phi. So um, if, we, if we take this function of phi, this function phi here, and we plug that into here, we get this. So we can say that for this mixture, the mass fraction of O2 depends on Z, and all we have to do is solve for Z, and we can get the mass fraction of O2. So that leads to what we call a state relation. The whole idea is we only want to solve one equation for Z, and then we want to just look up the values of all these other properties um, without having to solve any equations. So, Oops. I think what we'll do is we'll take a 15-minute break. Because, so uh, I'm going slowly, but uh, we're going to use all these concepts. So let's take a 15-minute break and 